Welcome. In this video, we're going to cover naive first order logic. I'm going to introduce the idea behind this based on the following example. So suppose that someone you know comes to you and tells you the following mathematical statement. Between every two rational numbers, there is a third one. Now, when you hear this, you might wonder whether it's true or not, and you might also think about how you would prove it if it is indeed true. Now, the first thing we have to do when we hear such a statement is we have to sort of break it down and make sure that we understand exactly what it means. The first thing we might notice is that this statement deals with rational numbers. So these are numbers of the form p over q, where p and q are some integers. So these are whole numbers which are either positive or negative. And in this case, we also don't want q to be 0, because otherwise we would be dividing by 0. Now, the thing this statement is expressing about the rational numbers is that, well, between every two of them, we have some third one. So for this, we need to think about what between means. The idea is that if we have uh, the rational numbers here, so I'm expressing this as a number line, so usually we denote the rational numbers with q. So whenever we take two given rational numbers here, let's say x and y, um, on this number line, well, then the statement is telling us that we can find a third one, z, which lies in between them. Now, the picture I drew here is somehow the typical case where the two numbers we started with are distinct from one another. However, we could imagine that two numbers on this uh, number line could also be the same. So we could have x and y given to us to be actually the same number. And then the question is, well, what does it mean to find a number between them? So really, the only plausible option is to choose z to be the same as x and y. But the question is whether this is allowed in our understanding of between. So there's sort of a strict version of being between two numbers. So this would be indicated by this drawing here, where z is like strictly between in the sense that it isn't equal to either x or y. Whereas in this edge case, where x is equal to y, well, in this case, we wouldn't be allowed to use the strict definition of between because there would be no numbers between, well, x and y because they're the same. So I hope that uh, this illustrates that even though at first sight the statement seems like it makes sense, there's actually ambiguity here, so we have to make some decisions on what the words in the statement actually mean. In addition, depending on what choices we make, the statement might actually be false or it might actually be true. In fact, if we allow this weak version of being between, where the z could actually equal either x or y, then the statement is basically trivial because you could always choose this third number, namely the z, to be just either x or y, and then the statement always holds for any number system. So in this case, the statement actually wouldn't be a statement about specific properties of the rational numbers. It'll just be a statement about ordered sets, which always holds. So probably that's not what is meant by the statement because in that case, it wouldn't be particularly interesting. On the other hand, if we want this between to be strict, well, then these two rational numbers here that we choose have to be distinct in order for the statement to hold. So we're not allowed to have this case here where x is equal to y. Now, if the statement was said by some person, well, then we could maybe ask them what they exactly meant. But if this were just like written in a book somewhere, well, then it's not really clear what this statement means. If it's written in the book, there might be a proof after it, and then the proof might give an indication of what the statement was supposed to mean. But in general, these types of natural language statements about uh, mathematical properties are oftentimes not 100% precise. And this motivates using language to express mathematical statements that is um, more clear, but maybe a bit less natural sounding. In this case, we could rephrase the statement to make it more precise by doing the following. Basically, I'm just going to paraphrase the explanation I gave when I drew this picture. So what I would write is, for all rational numbers x and y, where x is strictly less than y. So here I've picked two rational numbers, namely x and y. And moreover, I've imposed this condition that x be strictly less than y. This means that we're in this situation in the picture here, where x is lying strictly to the left of y. And I've excluded this case, which we found out is problematic. OK, now for any two such numbers, x and y, we want to say that there is a third one lying strictly between them. So there is 
a rational number z and what does this z satisfy so it satisfies that on the one hand it lies strictly to the right of x so z is greater than x and on the other hand it lies to the left of y so z is strictly less than y now, although this statement down here might sound a bit unnatural if you're not used to this type of mathematical language, it's way more precise than what's written up here. In particular, it doesn't use this word between, which is not entirely clear what it's supposed to mean, whether it means like strictly between or whether it's this weaker version where you could also be equal to one of the two numbers. And it also imposes this restriction here on x and y, namely that we want x to be strictly less than y. Whereas here in this statement, we just say we pick two rational numbers and implicitly we mean we pick two different ones, but it's not clear that these need to be different from this statement. And finally, we're saying that this third one, well, this z that we're trying to uh, obtain, this also needs to be a rational number. So we're being very explicit that this number we want to be between x and y should also be a rational number. And moreover, we express the betweenness using these inequalities. Now the idea behind first order logic will be to write these types of statements that I've written in blue in sort of a formal logical format. In first order logic, this statement reads, for all x in q, for all y in q, so these are two rational numbers x and y, if x is strictly less than y, so that's our condition on the x and y, then there exists a third number, z in q, so that's our third rational number z, and it satisfies that x is strictly less than z, and also z is strictly less than y. Okay, so let's maybe indicate where these different parts came from. So the for all is indicated by this universal quantifier, which is an inverted a. So we have this for all rational numbers x and y. So the rational numbers here are indicated by this q. So this part here is basically covering this part here. So for all rational numbers x and y. And then we have this condition, well, where x is strictly less than y. Another way to write this where here is to replace it with an if-then statement. So we would replace the where with an if, and then after the clause we put a then okay so then the statement reads for all rational numbers x and y if x is strictly less than y then there is a rational number z satisfying that x is strictly less than z and z is strictly less than y okay so that's what this part here is saying so we're saying that if x is strictly less than y then this thing holds so that's what this implication here means and this thing is saying that there exists a rational number z okay so that is the same as there is a rational number z. So here we have some sort of existential quantifier. So that means that there exists, there is at least one such number. And we write uh, this symbolically with this inverted e. And this z satisfies certain properties, namely that x is strictly less than z, and, so this is the logical connected and, and also z is strictly less than y. Okay, so I hope you can see how this translation happened. Notice that we have these logical connectives, which we saw before in propositional logic, but we also have these new um, types of things, namely these quantifiers appearing, and we're also talking about variables that live in certain sets. And moreover, we're using this inequality relation to compare these elements, and this inequality relation is given by the usual ordering on the rational numbers. Now, as in the case of propositional logic, Formulas which you can write down using these various symbols can be either grammatical or not, so not all of them are well-formed. Saying exactly what it means for a first-order logic formula to be well-formed is more complicated than in propositional logic because we have more parts. And in this naive treatment, I'm not going to be very precise about it. But a good heuristic for you is that a formula like so is grammatical if it can be translated into a meaningful mathematical statement analogous to the one above. When we do things more precisely, we'll see that we will define well-formed formulas recursively as we would do for propositional formulas.
As a consequence of this recursive definition, well-formed first-order logic formulas will have the property that they can be decomposed in the form of a parsing tree, and I'll illustrate this based on this example here. So the idea is that we can always view a formula as being built up from smaller subformulas. And the idea behind decomposing this formula is to say that, uh, well, in the last step of the construction of this formula, we're quantifying over all x and q, and we're quantifying over this subformula here. So if I decompose this, the last step would be adding this for all x in the rationals. And what have I added this to? Well, I've added it to this subformula here. So this quantification is somehow an operation which we can add to an existing well-formed formula. The same thing goes for this quantifier here for all y and q. So we can uh, remove that here. And the remaining subformula will be this one. Now things get a bit more interesting because now here the main connective will actually be this implication. So if you look at this formula here, we see that there's sort of two statements. We have on the one hand this x being strictly less than y, and then on the other hand we have the statement there exists a rational number z with the property that x is strictly less than z and z is strictly less than y. And if you look at the bracketing here, it's uh, clear that this is one statement and this is another. And these two statements are being joined by this implication. So in this case, we can parse out this implication and uh, see it as combining these two subformulas. So on the one hand, we have this subformula, x is strictly less than y. And on the other hand, we have this other subformula with the existential quantifier. And these are being combined using this implication. Okay, now let's proceed further on the left. So on the left, we now have this statement x is strictly less than y. And we can think of this as being composed of two variables. So we can have uh, here variables x and y. And they're being compared using this um, inequality relation. On the other hand, on this right branch, we have this existential quantifier being the main connective. We can again view this existential quantifier as being added to this subformula here. This is exactly the same as for the universal quantifier. So we have here this exists in Q being added to this subformula here. And now this subformula, if we look at this, we see that we have these two statements being combined with a conjunction. So if X is less than Z and Z is less than Y, and this and is combining these two propositions. So we can again decompose this into two smaller statements, namely x is less than z and z is less than y. And these are being combined using the conjunction. And finally, we can decompose these statements individually into variables x, z, z, and y using this uh, inequality relation. Okay, I hope this parsing tree illustrates how this large complicated formula is built up using various types of connectives. You can see that we start with these variables, which lie in this case in the rational numbers. And these variables are first combined using this inequality relation. And then we can further combine these propositions we obtain from doing so. We can combine these propositions using logical connectives and we can also add these existential and universal quantifiers. This is in fact in general how one builds up well-formed first-order logic formulas. You start with these variables and then you use relations or functions that exist on the set that these variables are contained in. For instance, this inequality relation, or you could also use equality relations, or you could use like a function applied to these variables and so on. So using these functions and relations, you build up propositions like this one, this one, and this one. So the reason these can be viewed as propositions is because if we choose specific x's and y's, these statements are either true or false. However, in contrast to propositional logic, these propositions somehow depend on the choice of x and y and z. So one way you could think about this is that this is a proposition, let's say p, 
but it's a function of x and y, so whether p is true depends on which x and y you choose. And similarly, this could be like q, x, z, and this could be r, z, y. Okay, so once you have these propositions built up out of the variables combined with relations and functions, you can then apply the connectives from propositional logic, so things like conjunction, disjunction, implication, and so on. So that's, for example, what's happening here. We have these two propositions and we're combining them using a conjunction. Furthermore, in first order logic, we also have two quantifiers, namely this existential quantifier and this universal quantifier. And we're allowed to quantify over any well-formed formula. Moreover, when we choose to quantify over such a formula, we always need to select which variable we're quantifying over. And generally, we'll select a variable which is already contained in this formula. And we then say that the quantifier binds this variable. For instance, here we're binding the variable z. So here z occurs as an unbound variable. That just means that it's not being quantified over. Whereas here in this formula, z is bound by this existential quantifier. So this existential quantifier here is referring to these two occurrences of the z's in this proposition. In principle, one could also quantify over variables which don't occur in the formula one is quantifying over, but that really doesn't add anything to the meaning of the formula. The final thing we can notice is that in our formula, which expresses the mathematical statement we were trying to prove, all the variables are bound. So for instance, the z that occurs here and here is being bound by this existential quantifier occurring here, whereas the x's and the y's, which are occurring throughout, are being bound by these universal quantifiers in the front of the formula. The reason for this is that statements in first order logic only become true or false when all of the variables have been bound or quantified over. As a simple example to see this, consider this proposition here, x is strictly less than y. Well, whether this is true or false depends on which x and y you choose. For instance, if I choose one for x and two for y, then this is true. Whereas if I would choose two for x and one for y, then this would be false. Therefore, the truth of this proposition here depends on the choice of x and y. And that's why here I've expressed this proposition as depending on x and y. On the other hand, consider the statement, there exists an x and there exists a y for which p x of y holds. Or in other words, there exists x of y such that x is strictly less than y. Well, this is true because I can, for instance, choose x to be one and y to be two. But I could also choose x to be zero and y to be one. And there are infinitely many choices I could, I could make to make this statement true. So here, once I've bound the occurrences of x and y in this proposition, well, then the statement becomes either true or false. So in this case, it would be true. But if I would replace this with universal quantifiers, so I would say for all x and for all y, x is strictly less than y, then this is not true because there are x's and y's which I could choose for which this statement doesn't hold. For instance, I could choose x to be two and y to be one. All right, so in summary, to build these first order formulas, you start with some variables. You use relations and functions on the set you have available in order to build propositions which might still depend on the choices of x and y. Then we can combine these propositions using the logical connectives we saw in propositional logic. And we can also quantify over variables using existential and universal quantifiers. And if we do these steps iteratively, then we obtain well-formed formulas. And usually we'll be interested in having formulas where we actually bound all of the variables so that we have statements which are either true or false. The final thing I'd like to mention before moving on to seeing a bunch of examples is the use of restricted quantifiers. In the example statement we saw before, we always had quantifiers occurring in the following form. So we always had something like for all x and q, something holds. This would be an example of a restricted quantifier because we're saying explicitly in what set x lives, whereas an unrestricted quantification would just be something like for all x. Okay, so this is restricted. This is unrestricted. Now it's possible to move between both of these forms and I'll illustrate how to do this. For this, let's consider the following two statements which use restricted quantification. So consider the statement for all x and r, x is strictly greater than zero. 
in this case, this statement happens to be false because, in fact, there are real numbers which aren't strictly positive. And let's also look at the statement. There exists an x in R such that x is greater than zero. In this case, this statement is true because, well, there are numbers which are strictly positive in the reals. It's just not that every number is of this form. Now, the idea is to rewrite these statements that use restricted quantification uh, in a form that doesn't use restricted quantification, so where we only have these unrestricted quantifiers occurring. Now, this is a bit tricky because the conversion rule depends on which quantifier you're using. So let's think about first what this statement means. So it's saying that for every x, which is a real number, we want that uh, x is strictly greater than zero. Now, I want to rewrite this in something which uses unrestricted quantification. So I'm going to say for all x, and then the way to proceed is to notice that this is the same as saying for all x, if x is an element of the real numbers, then x is strictly positive, like so. So these two statements here are, are the same. So the statement on the left is saying all real numbers are strictly positive, whereas here it's saying all elements x whatsoever, if they are real numbers, well, then they are strictly positive. And hopefully it should be intuitive to you that those two things mean the same thing. On the other hand, if we want to translate this into an unrestricted quantification, well, I'm going to say that there exists some x, but now what does this x have to satisfy? Well, here this statement is saying there is some real number that is strictly positive. So in this case, I want to say there exists an x such that x is a real number and also x is strictly positive. So here there exists an x such that x is in R and x is strictly greater than zero. Again, I hope that if you give this some thought, it will become clear to you that these two statements mean the same thing. As you can see, depending on whether we have a universal or an existential quantifier occurring in the restricted quantification, we need to use a different way of translating it into this unrestricted quantification. To see why we can't use these two ways of converting interchangeably, let's think about what the difference is if we would replace this implication here by an and and replace this um, conjunction here by an implication. So let's first think about what this statement means if we have a conjunction here. So it would be saying for all x, x is a real number and also x is strictly positive. But this is not what this statement is saying because this is just saying that for all real numbers, x is strictly positive, but there might be other numbers that aren't real for which this statement doesn't hold. Whereas in this case over here, if we're saying that for all x, x is a real number and x is strictly positive, then we're saying that all x's whatsoever are real numbers, but in fact, there might also be x's we're talking about that aren't real. For instance, if we're talking about complex numbers, so these x's here would be complex, well then not every complex number is real, and so already this part of the statement would always make it false. This is the reason why we need to use the implication here in the correct translation, because we only want to talk about those x's which are real. In the case of the existential quantifier, things are different. So suppose that we had falsely translated the statement here using the implication. Well, let's think about what this would then mean. So it would be saying that there is some x such that if x is a real number, then x is strictly positive. Now, what could go wrong here? Well, think again about the case where the x's we're interested in could also be complex numbers. In that case, there are x's that are not real, so this thing would be false, which would make this implication trivially true. For instance, I could choose the imaginary unit i, right? so I could choose i, so if i is a real number, then, well, i is strictly greater than zero. That's a trivially true statement because i is, in fact, not a real number. Therefore, because I have x's which are non-real, this statement will always be true because this implication is trivially true. Now, why would that be a problem? Well, consider the false statement. There exists x in R such that x is strictly greater than x. This can't occur because no real number is strictly greater than itself. Well, if I now translate this using the, the wrong method to there exists x, such that x is in R implies that x is greater than x. Well, then I could choose the 
imaginary unit i for an x. And this thing would then become trivially true because it's just saying that, well, if i is real, then i is strictly greater than itself. Now, because the premises are false, the implication is true. And therefore, this statement here would be true, whereas this one is false. So this can't be the correct translation of this type of statement. On the other hand, if I put the conjunction here, as in the correct version of the translation, well, then this thing with choosing i as a possible x no longer works because i is not a real number. So this thing is false, and therefore the entire conjunction is false. Therefore, the conjunction here forces me to have this thing be true in order for the entire conjunct to be true. And therefore, it forces the x I'm choosing to actually lie in the real numbers as is intended in the statement over here. OK, so I hope this makes it clear why the rules are as they are. If you still have doubts, I encourage you to think about some examples on your own and see what would go wrong if you would translate these things in different ways. Now, when we do things formally, we won't actually make use of restricted quantification. So sort of formally, we'll define everything using these unrestricted quantifiers. But then we'll view these restricted versions of quantification sort of as an abbreviation for these types of statements. However, these restricted quantifiers can make the formulas a lot more compact, especially if the sets we're quantifying over um, are maybe a bit more complicated than just the real numbers. To illustrate this point, let's consider the following formula, which uses restricted quantifiers. So it says for all x and q, there exists n and m in z. So these are integers, satisfying that n is non-zero, and also x is equal m divided by n. Let's first think about what this formula is saying. So it's saying that for every rational number x, there exists n and m integers such that n is non-zero, and also x can be written as the ratio between m and n. Now, if you think about this, this is just basically the definition of what it means for x to be a rational number. So this statement is obviously true by definition. But as you can see, it uses these restricted quantifiers here. So now let's rewrite this into something that doesn't. Because we have these two different rules for the universal and existential quantifier, it's often good to do this in steps. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this into something um, where I make explicit that this part here of the formula actually uses two existential quantifiers. So there exists n in z and there exists m in z such that n is non-zero and also x is equal m over n. So now we're in the situation where the innermost formula here uses an existential quantifier. So we should apply this rule and we can sort of keep this part the same and we just rewrite the this sub formula using the rule. What I get is for all x in q, there exists n in z and there exists m such that, well, m lies in z and n is non zero and x is equal m over n. So here I've just used this rule, the second one here for the essential quantifier to replace this restricted quantification with an unrestricted version. I include the condition here in the formula using a conjunction. Now notice here I omitted some brackets, so I should bracket it in this way because we've now conjoined uh, this formula here with this one in the last step. Okay, so now I proceed to the next innermost uh, quantifier. So this restricted version quantifies over this subformula. So I can just apply the same rule again. So what I get is for all x in q, there exists n, there exists m, such that n lies in z, and also m lies in z, and also n is non-zero, and x is m over n. And in the final step, I remove this restricted quantification using the rule for universal quantifiers. So I get for all x, there exists n, there exists m. And now I need to use the implication. So x is in q implies, and then I need to write this entire subformula here. So let's do that. n is in z, and m is in z, and also n is non zero and also x is equal to m over n. Let's see whether I got the brackets right. So we have this pair, this pair, this pair, and this pair. Okay. 
All right, so that's an exercise in how to do this rewriting in a more complex example. And I hope you can see that basically writing out this unrestricted version is super tedious, whereas this version is much clearer about what it's saying, and it's also shorter. In the last part of this video, I'm just going to give you a bunch of examples of mathematical statements and how to write them down as first order logic formulas. While doing this, I'll also talk a bit about what it means for first order logic formulas to be logically valid or tautologies, and uh, what it means for two formulas to be logically equivalent to one another. But let's first start with this example of the following statement, which we want to translate. So it says that the equation x squared plus 1 is equal to 0 has a solution. Another way of saying this is that there is some number x such that x squared is equal to minus 1. And this is just the defining property of the imaginary unit in the complex numbers. Let's again proceed in the same way as I did in the example I gave in the introduction to this video. So the idea is to somehow rephrase this with um, statements like for all and there exists and so on. This will be more precise than this statement here because here the, the, we use the phrase has a solution, but in order to understand what the statement means, we need to know what it means for some equation to have a solution. And well, this concept could be ambiguous or undefined. So a more precise version of this would be saying that, well, there exists some x such that x squared plus 1 is equal to 0. So that's just what it means for this equation here to have a solution. It means that there is some number x which satisfies the equation, meaning that, well, x squared plus 1 is equal to 0. Now, based on this blue statement, we can more or less directly write down the corresponding first order logic formula. So it's just there exists x such that x squared plus 1 is equal to 0. Let's again think about why this formula here is well formed. Well, if you would parse it, basically you're starting with sort of a variable x here, then you're squaring it, you're adding 1, so these two things are functions, and then you're using equality to compare it to 0, and that gives you a proposition, namely that x squared plus 1 is equal to 0, and finally, we quantify over the variable x in order to bind it. And this gives us a statement which is either true or false. So maybe I can explicitly write down the parsing tree quickly here. So in the first step, we remove the existential quantifier. Then in the second step, we have this equality which compares 0 with x squared plus 1. And then here in this step, we divide into x squared and 1 which you combine with plus. And finally here we apply squaring, so the square function to x. So the steps we have here is here we use equality, here we use plus, and here we use the square function. We see here that this formula deviates slightly from what we saw in the introductory example. So whereas there we just started with some variables x, y, and z as the leaves of our tree, here we have some additional things, namely constant symbols. So aside from using variables x and y and z and so on, we're also allowed to use constant symbols. In this case, we have the symbol 1 and 0. And if we interpret this formula, well, these will be interpreted as the number 0 and 1, respectively. Okay, so that's what forms the leaves of our set. And then we see here, for example, we apply this function to x to get x squared. And then we combine x squared with 1 using the plus function. This is also a function. It just takes two arguments in this case, whereas the squaring takes one argument. And so we get these more complicated expressions. And then we can combine these more complicated expressions using the relations on the set. So up until now here, we just used functions. But now we uh, use this equality relation in order to compare these two elements to get this proposition here. So here, this thing is a proposition, which depends on x. So we could think of it as a something like a p of x. It doesn't depend on any other uh, choices since these constant symbols here um, are interpreted as fixed elements of our set and therefore they don't vary. And finally we quantify over the only free variable which exists in this proposition which is the x 
in order to get a statement which is either true or false, namely there exists x such that x squared plus 1 is equal to 0. So in contrast to the introductory example we saw, we have these constants appearing, which can also be the leaves of our parsing tree. Moreover, we also now have functions being applied to the uh, variable x here. So we have this squaring happening, and we also have this plus happening between two elements. But the general structure is the same. We start by applying some functions and some relations in order to get some propositions here, a p of x. And then we combine these propositions using logical connectives and quantify over certain variables. Here we just quantify over x. Okay, so I hope you can see how this formula is built up and why it's well formed. And now let's turn to think about whether it's true or not. So as it stands, this formula is just saying that there exists some x such that x squared plus 1 is equal to 0, but we're not saying where these x's live. And while the truth of this statement depends on where we interpret these x's as living. For instance, if we only think about real numbers, then the statement is false, since the square of any real number is non-negative, so there is no real number x such that x squared is equal to minus 1. On the other hand, in the complex numbers, this statement is true, since i squared is equal to minus 1, therefore i squared plus 1 is equal to 0. So what I'm trying to get at here is that in order for the truth value of this statement to be defined, we need to interpret it in some sort of structure. In particular, we need to say where the x's and the y's and so on live. So to assign a truth value. This thing must be interpreted in a structure. And what do I mean by a structure? Well, I mean we have to specify some set in which the variables live. For example, we could choose the real numbers as the set in which the x is allowed to live. But in addition to just saying where the variables live, we also need to say exactly what these symbols here refer to. So in order to interpret this formula, not only do I need to say where the x lives, but I also need to say what precisely the squaring function is, what this addition function is, and also what these constant symbols here refer to. So the entire structure here that needs to be present in order for this formula to be interpreted is I need to be able to interpret well the variables, I need to be able to interpret the square function, I need to be able to interpret this plus function, I need to be able to interpret 1, and I need to also interpret 0. The only exception to this is basically this equality symbol here. Equality is something we're given on any set, so the equality is already predefined once we say what the set is. However, these functions here aren't predefined, since in principle, we could define weird exotic versions of addition depending on what set we're in. The obvious interpretation if we choose um, the real numbers as our set for the variables would be that, well, this squaring function is actually the like squaring function we know from the real numbers, this addition is the addition we know from the real numbers, and the 1 is the usual 1 in the real numbers, and 0 is the usual 0 in the real numbers. So another structure we could use in which the formula is true in this case is the complex numbers with the usual square function, usual addition, usual 1, and usual 0. Okay, so these will be two structures in which we can interpret this formula, but we could also think of other sets aside from this, so we could like take an arbitrary set and define certain operations, namely this squaring operation, this plus operation, we could designate a 1 element and a 0 element in the set, and then this formula could be interpreted in that setting. Now, if you think back to propositional logic, we had a similar thing going on. We somehow built up formulas from propositions using the logical connectives. But then the truth value of those formulas sort of depended on how we assigned truth values to the atomic propositions occurring in the formula. So if you think of the statement P1 and P2, the truth of this statement depends on whether P1 is true and whether P2 is true. Therefore, in order to determine the truth value of the statement, you also need to interpret this formula here in a sort of structure where you assign p1 and p2 individual truth values. Now in the case of these propositional formulas here, the structure in which we interpret them is very simple because basically we're just assigning each of these atomic propositions a truth value, so either true or false. So in some sense these p1 and p2 just live in the set 0, 1. 
Now, in first order logic, we're allowed to talk about more interesting things than just these binary truth values. We're allowed to talk about elements of sets and functions on those sets, as well as relations on those sets. And therefore, in order to interpret these formulas, we have to say what all of these things mean. So here in the formula, basically, these things are just symbols. So all of these things are just symbols. And we need to say what exactly these symbols are defined as if we want to interpret um, this formula concretely in a mathematical structure. To conclude this analogy between these propositional logic formulas and interpreting them with truth values, and also interpreting a first order logic formula in a structure, I'd like to briefly talk about um, logical validity, so being a tautology and also being logically equivalent. So in the case of these propositional logic formulas, we said that a formula is a tautology if it's true regardless of what truth values we assign to the atomic propositions. Now, if we think about this sort of interpreting in a structure picture, what this is saying is that we're saying that this formula is a tautology if regardless which structure we interpret this formula in, it remains true. And in fact, we can make the same definition for first order logic formulas. So we can say that a first order logic formula is valid or a tautology if it's true regardless of which structure we interpret it in. For instance, this thing is not a valid formula because in this structure here, the one with the real numbers, it's false. One example of a first order logic formula that's tautological is the following. For all x, x is equal to x. So this is a tautology because regardless in what set you interpret this in, it's basically just expressing that every element is equal to itself. And that's true by sort of the way we establish set theory. So this thing holds in any structure. So we could choose the real numbers, the complex numbers, we could choose any set whatsoever. And this formula will remain true. And therefore, this thing is a tautology in first order logic. Recall also from propositional logic that we had this idea of being logically equivalent. So we write things like capital Phi is logically equivalent to capital Psi to mean that whenever we assign certain uh, truth values to the atomic propositions occurring in both of these formulas, they assume the same truth value overall. In other words, once we make certain assignments for the atomic propositions occurring here, well, then if Psi is true, then Phi is true and conversely, and if Phi would turn out to be false, then Psi would also turn out to be false. And they have to always assume the same truth values overall, regardless what assignments we make to the atomic propositions occurring in them. Now in this structure view, if we think about assigning truth values to the atomic propositions as interpreting these formulas in a structure, what this is saying is that, well, regardless in what structure we interpret both these formulas in, they always assume the same truth value. And thus we can generalize this definition to first order logic by saying that two formulas in first order logic are logically equivalent if regardless in what structure we interpret them in, they always assume the same truth value. So let me give you an example of logically equivalent first order logic formulas. So we have that for all x, for all y, phi of x, y. So this phi here could be any sort of proposition which depends on x and y. So this will always be logically equivalent to for all y, for all x, phi, x, y. In other words, if we interchange the order of these universal quantifiers here, the two resulting formulas will be logically equivalent. Now this equivalence here stems from the way we interpret these formulas in any structure. So we say that, well, a quantified formula is true if, well, for all elements x, the formula for the corresponding x is true. And well, if you have this for all, you're basically choosing an arbitrary x in your set. And it doesn't matter if you first choose x and then a y and then look at whether a statement is true or whether you first choose y and then choose x and look at whether the statement is true. An example of a less trivial equivalence is the following. So if I say that it's not the case that for all x, phi of x holds, well, this is the same as saying that there exists some x for which phi of x does not hold. Maybe I should add some brackets here to make clear what's going on. So here on the left, I'm saying that the following formula is false, namely that for all x, phi of x holds. So what does this mean? Well, if 
If it's not the case that for all x phi of x holds, well, there, then there must be an exception to the rule. So in that case, there must exist some x for which phi of x does not hold. So that's the intuitive explanation for why this equivalence holds. But as of yet, we don't have any rules yet to establish these types of equivalences in contrast to what we did in propositional logic, where we could just prove these sorts of things using truth tables. We'll see in the next video how to prove first order logic statements, although it won't be fully justified why the rules I'll be presenting work. When we do first order logic rigorously, well, then I'll be very specific about all of this structure business. So I'll be very specific about what it means to interpret formulas in a structure and also what it means for, well, these types of formulas to be true or false. In that case, we'll then more or less directly see how you would need to prove these types of equivalences and the rules of proof that I present in the next video will follow naturally from that. For the moment, I think the take home message I want to convey is just that we can still talk about valid formulas in first order logic, but the concept of interpreting formulas is more complicated than in propositional logic. And similarly, we can also talk about logical equivalence between formulas, but somehow in order to determine logical equivalence, we need to look at the truth value of these formulas in all possible structures. As you can imagine, checking something for all possible structures is going to be much more difficult than just checking things for all possible assignments of truth values to atomic propositions. Therefore, the proof theory for first order logic will be much more interesting than for propositional logic, because basically we need to develop methods that allow us to check whether formulas are equivalent and so on without like explicitly checking the, every interpretation of a formula in every structure, which is impossible. Okay, let's move on to a second example, which says that there are infinitely many primes. Again, this statement is very compact, but we have to know a lot about the words occurring in it. For instance, we have to know what it means to have infinitely many of something, and we also have to know what primes are. So let's think about one way of translating the statement into something a bit more precise and concrete. So the way I'm going to do this, I'm going to say that for every natural number n, there exists a prime number, which I'll call p, such that p is greater or equal than n. Okay, let's think about why this is the same as the above statement. So basically, I'm saying that regardless which natural number n I choose, I can find a prime number which is at least as big as n. Now, since there are infinitely many natural numbers, it means that I can always choose a very large natural number and find the prime bigger, and then, well, I can choose an even bigger natural number and then find the prime that is again bigger and so on, and this gives me infinitely many primes. So this statement here is more explicit, but it still isn't completely explicit because it still uses this concept of being a prime number. So let's write out in detail what it means for p to be a prime number. p being prime means on the one hand that p is strictly greater than one. So p is at least two. And also we want that p doesn't have any proper divisors. So what does it mean for p to not have any proper divisors? It means that, well, if we find some divisor of p, so if d is some natural number which divides p, and I'm going to express this using this symbol here, so this horizontal line should be read as d divides p, then d must be equal to either 1 or d is equal to p. So that's what it means for p to not have any proper divisors. It means that any divisor of p is either 1 or p itself. Now in language, we can't put brackets, but I'm still kind of going to put brackets here to express exactly how these uh, different statements are to be interpreted. So I want to say that P is greater than one and also the following implication holds, namely that if P has a divisor D, then either D is one or D is equal to P. Okay, so that's being even more explicit about what it means to be a prime number. And with this, we can now actually write this down as a first order logic formula. 
So what I'm saying here is that for any natural number n, there exists some p, which is also a natural number, such that on the one hand, p is prime, which I'm just going to express with this predicate prime p. So this will be replaced by a formula which will be true precisely when p is prime. And also, we want p to be greater or equal than n. So, so far, this statement here just paraphrases the blue statement here. And now I want to define what it means to be prime. So I want to paraphrase this pink statement in first order logic. So what does it mean to be prime? Well, p is prime, so prime p is defined to be, well, on the one hand, p is greater than one. And also, I want p to not have any proper divisors. So what does this mean? Well, it means for any number d in the natural numbers, if d is a divisor of p, well, then d is either 1 or d is equal to p. So here you can see how I paraphrase the pink statement. Well, the p greater than 1 stays the same, the and becomes a conjunction, and this implication here should hold for any number d which divides p, so that's why we put a universal quantifier there. Now, you might still complain that I haven't defined what this division here means, so what does it mean for d to divide p? This can itself be viewed as a predicate on d and p, so I can define this in terms of a first-order logic formula as well. So d divides p, what does this mean? Well, it means that there exists some other number q. This also needs to be a natural number, such that q times d is equal to p. So d divides p if we can find another number q, such that q times d is equal to p. Or another way to express that would be to say that d is a factor of p. Now, if you wanted, you could plug in this definition of being a divisor in this formula here, and then you could plug in this entire formula with that plugged in divisor formula into the predicate prime p. And this would give you a huge first order logic formula um, that expresses exactly uh, the statement that there are infinitely many primes. But it's much clearer if you separate things out like this and, well, define certain predicates and so on. As a final example, consider the following uniqueness statement. So it says that there is only one prime number. This is like the opposite of the statement we had that there are infinitely many primes. In this case, the statement is false, but let's still try to write it down in first order logic. The tricky thing here is that in first order logic, we only have these two quantifiers, namely you have the existential quantifier, which says that there is at least one element satisfying some condition. And then we have this universal quantifier, which says that all elements satisfy this condition. But we don't have a specific quantifier, which says that exactly one element satisfies a specific condition, in this case being prime. Nonetheless, we can express this um, using only existential and universal quantifiers. And the trick is to notice um, the following thing, that we can reformulate the fact that there is a unique thing, or only one, in the following way. So the way to rewrite this in natural language is the following. You would say there is a prime number, let's say p. So that's expressing the existence part of this statement. So when we say there is only one prime number, in particular, we're saying there is some prime number. Okay, so there is a prime number p. And for all prime numbers, uh, let's call it q, we have that p is equal to q. So the statement in blue is saying that on the one hand, there is some prime number p, but also for all prime numbers q, we have that p is equal to q, which means that if we take any other number, which is a prime number, in fact, that prime number is equal to the original prime number p. In summary, there is only one prime number because, well, if we take any other prime number, it's equal to that original prime number p. So this statement in blue here is the same as saying that there is only one prime number. Admittedly, this blue statement is, in this case, maybe not clearer than the orange one. It's more convoluted, 
But the advantage is that it only uses the idea of existential quantification, namely that there is some prime number p, and universal quantification, namely that, well, for all prime numbers q, we have that p is equal to q. Based on this blue statement, we can now more or less directly translate into first order logic. So we'd say that there exists some natural number p, which is prime. So I'll use again this prime predicate, which we defined on the previous slide. And moreover, for all natural numbers q, which are prime, so for all q and n, if um, q is prime, then in fact, p is equal to q. So the formula in purple is the first order logic version of this blue statement. So it's saying that there exists some natural number p where p is prime. And also, and here is this uniqueness portion for any other natural number q, if that number is prime, then in fact, p is equal to q. Okay, so I hope that uh, this is comprehensible. You may notice that this statement here looks very similar to what we were doing when we we're translating between restricted and unrestricted quantifications. And also here, this uh, form also looks similar to that. In fact, we could rewrite this entire thing as a restricted quantification, saying for all q in p, where p is the set of prime numbers, um, we have that p is equal to q. And we could, in fact, rewrite this entire thing using restricted quantifiers there exists some p in the set of primes, capital P, such that for all q in this set of primes, capital P, we have that p is equal to q. So here I've used uh, the rules for translating between restricted quantification and unrestricted ones. So I view this as an unrestricted quantification and translate it into this restricted quantification. And then I also do the same thing with this existential quantifier here. And we get this very short statement, which resembles this one more closely. On the other hand, we've somehow hidden the complexity that's going on here in this set of primes p. And if we wanted to actually define explicitly what it means for a number to be prime, then this would be much harder if we had this restricted version where we're just hiding all of the definition in this set of primes. Now, if you wanted to go about proving this formula, you would need to expand it into its full definition. So you would need to expand it into the unrestricted version, and you would also need to expand what this predicate means of being prime. Okay, with that, I'm done with what I wanted to say in this video. In the next video, we'll be seeing how we can actually prove these types of formulas that are formulated in first order logic. And there'll be specific proof rules for each of the quantifiers and connectives occurring in these formulas. So if you're given some first order logic formula, in principle, it's sort of a mechanical thing to know what you need to be proving. But then of course, proving the individual steps might be difficult mathematically.